dumb Levin is a bastard. What? Is the judge a bastard, McLean? Someone scratched that on the wall at Strathmere Prison. Lord Dunleven is a bastard. No doubt the author was a criminal and therefore prejudiced. What concerns me is, will the judge be prejudiced? Is the boy likely to get a fair trial? Rape and murder, how does one get round that? Mr Beresford, I wouldn't recommend the sentimental approach in a Scottish court, even if your counsel is a female. Is she any good? Julia Stanford's been very successful. She's one of the few women at the bar who's made a name for herself. Up here, we think a woman's place is in the home. Any local jury is bound to feel that. No, Mr. Beresford, with respect, a leading Scottish advocate would have been a safer choice. <laughs> safer? That's just the trouble. It's all safely cut and dried already. So we've got to come up with something unexpected. If there's anyone who can do that, it's Julia Stanford. Adrian, I don't understand what there is to argue about. If you're sure this famous lady is the best, then get her. Pay her anything she asks. It isn't as easy as all that, Mrs Harper. It will not be money that decides. It will be up to Julia Stanford after she's talked to Alan. You mean she might say no? Very likely. We'll do our best to persuade her, of course. She ought to be here any minute now. She phoned from the airport. But Alan is innocent, I ought to know. I'm his mother. I know him better than anyone. Then let's hope Miss Stanford's instinct is the same. As things stand at the moment, the defence hasn't got a case. Oh. Julia, my dear. Adrian. <laughs> Where's your luggage? I told them to keep it downstairs until I'm sure I'm staying. I see. Well, let me introduce you. This is Mrs. Harper, the mother of the accused boy. Miss Stanford. How do you do? Miss Stanford, I'm very grateful. I've heard so much about you. And this is Alistair MacLeod, my Scottish agent. Mr. MacLeod. I expect you're tired. Like a drink? Thank you, Scotch. MacLeod special, distilled expressly for tired barristers. <laughs> well, now, Julia, what's your feeling? I've gone through the brief very thoroughly. Um, it reads like an open and shut case for the prosecution. Well, apart from the open and shut aspect, what's your opinion? I can't think why you sent for me in particular. Why didn't you brief one of the Scottish silks? Because I think you'd do a better job. <laughs> Adrian, you're asking an English woman to go into a Scottish court in opposition to one of their most respected ground counsel. Now, do you honestly think I have a chance? That is the question. My personal standing up here is nil. I'd have to appear as a junior. If you can't pull it off, then nobody can. Excuse me, I find all this terribly confusing. Miss Stanford, do I understand that you only take the cases you're certain you can win? No, I don't. And I don't always win, either. What I'm trying to do is give the best possible advice I can in your son's own interest. Well, it seems to me Carl, that... look, nothing can be finally decided until Miss Stanford's talked to Ellen. But he won't talk to anyone, not even to me. That's our problem, Carl. Now, I'd like to talk to Miss Stanford alone, please, before we go and see Alan. Very well. The thing I don't understand is how Miss Stanford can defend Alan at all, unless she really believes that he's innocent. Yeah, Coral, please. I'll phone you later. Quite a formidable lady. <laughs> She's difficult, I know, but don't misjudge her, Julia. She's had quite a struggle. Her husband left her when Alan was five. She was practically penniless, but she opened a little dress shop, which became a success. One led to another, and she's made a fortune. But she's had to work for it and make a lot of sacrifices. And her son? Oh, I'm sure she really loves him, when she has the time. Alan's her tragedy, and she doesn't even know it. Oh, Julia, I'm sorry. There are parallels, I suppose. Have you seen Bill lately? No, not since the divorce. I'm having dinner with him when I get back to town. Give him my regards. I will. Anything else? No. I wish there was something I could do. You can't, Adrian. Neither can I. Now, if we don't waste any more time before seeing the boy, I might be able to get my plane back to London tonight. It's not far. I've got the car outside. Good afternoon, Alan. Alan, this is Miss Stanford. Adrian, that wasn't fair. It's pure coincidence. It won't influence me, you know. Sit down, Alan. Miss Stanford has some questions to ask. I you. don't want to sit down. And I'm not going to answer any more questions. I just want to get it over with. 
Well, since I've been asked to defend you, we might as well exchange a few words. Look, I don't want to be defended. Just lock me away in my cell and forget about me. Adrian, I'm nearly out of cigarettes. Would you mind? Yes, of course. Thank you. I suppose you think I might talk without an audience. I won't, you know. Just as you like. As a matter of fact, I do need some cigarettes, and I'd rather not have Adrian Beresford breathing down my neck while I make up my mind. What about? Whether or not I can do anything for you. Your mother doesn't think I can. Why not? I'm supposed to believe passionately in your innocence before I can defend you properly. And you don't? Why should I? I've read the brief. It's perfectly clear you had motive and opportunity to kill Anne Laird. And your statement to the police is a virtual confession. So, that's it then. I don't envy whoever has to defend you in the end. The best you can go for is a plea in mitigation. That the girl provoked you, behaved badly. Girls do sometimes. Yes, well, Anne didn't. It was meant as a joke. Why are you so sure? Because I knew her better than anyone else. Better than her own father? Yes, of course. I, I loved her. And she loved you? Yes, she did. So much so that she was going to have a baby, your baby. Yes. Yet this girl who loved you so much and whom you loved went to the police about ten days before she was killed and accused you of rape. Was that a joke? Her father made her go. But if you loved each other, the rape story couldn't have been true, so why make it up? Look, you don't live in this town. Nosy Parkers, gossips, everybody minding everybody else's business. Anne's father wanted to make it clear that it wasn't her fault, that's all. So he charges you with rape. <laughs> I can't think of anything better calculated to cause a scandal. The man must be a perfect idiot. If you were appearing on that charge, I'd defend you with pleasure and get an acquittal. Oh, you wouldn't, because I'd have said I did it. To protect Anne? You must have loved her very much. Now she's dead. You can't protect her any longer. It's time you thought about yourself and your future. I haven't got a future. No, not the future you were looking forward to with Anne. We wanted to get married. She was only 16. We, we, we knew her father would say she was too young. But when Colonel Laird knew about the baby, surely the best thing would have been to let you get married. Well, that's what I hoped, I suppose. That night, when Anne said she didn't want to see you again, what exactly happened? Well, I... Well, well I, could, I could still hardly believe it. She... She uh, gave me a gun. On one of her father's. I, 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 and she told me to shoot myself. And you ran away? Uh, uh, yes, that, that's all I can remember. Just, just, just running and, and running. I, I, I must have gone around in a circle or something. And, Oh, when I got back there, I, I found her. Oh, and, and she was dead. I, I, I don't know what happened. I, I can't, can't remember anything. Did your mother know about Anne? Oh, not really. Well, she wouldn't have understood either. Maybe not. But she might have been able to help. Oh, not mine. She's never there. Would you talk to her if she were? No, I don't suppose so. Do you ever see your father? I know. I've never even met him. I don't even know where he is. Do you know anything about him? Not much. Except he left Mother when I was a baby. He was probably quite right. Oh, what do you keep staring at me for? You remind me of somebody. Oh? Who do I remind you of? My son. Well, then I'm sorry for him. If he has my luck, he'll come to a sticky end. Have I said something? Julian died of leukemia two years ago. He was only 19. I was... I was defending in a case and by the time I got to the hospital it was too late. Just like my mother. You were too busy to be there. Yes. So now you see what Adrian Beresford meant? Hardly fair. And I don't blame you for refusing to defend me. I do the same. All right, Alan, that's enough. Would you ring the bell? Look, I, um, wasn't very nice to you. I'm sorry. And I'm, uh, sorry about your son. Thank you.
And the leper, I proclaim my unclean presence with a bell. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, what's the answer? Your remarkable little coincidence didn't have much effect. I'm sorry. And you didn't get anything out of him? Not much. He says he can't remember the most vital things. Do you think he's speaking the truth? Poor little devil. In his state, he's incapable of lying. I'll see him tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Then you'll defend? Yes, Adrian, I will. Not because he reminds me of Julian, but because in spite of the weight of evidence, I simply cannot believe Alan Harper is a murderer. Inspector Firth, there were a number of fingerprints on the revolver. Whose were they? Those of the dead girl and her father's, but Harper's prints were on top of them. What conclusion did you draw from that? That Harper was the last person to handle the gun, sir. Precisely, that Harper was the last person to handle the gun. I'm obliged. Uh, Would you now take a look at the bundle of clothing, label number four? This is the clothing of the dead girl, sir. Describe it, please. The front upper portion of all the garments is heavily bloodstained, sir, and there's a bullet hole in the jacket, blouse and slip just below the left breast, showing the position of the wound. What about the uh, handbag? Beyond the usual articles of makeup, sir, there was a checkbook, three pounds, ten shillings and notes, and four and sixpence in small change. It was lying unopened, partly beneath the body, sir. Nothing to indicate robbery as a motive, then? No, sir. Label number four, the dead girl's clothes, and label number one, the revolver. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you were never in the forces, I take it? My lord? Oh, no, no, my lord. Then you will not recall the simple rhyme which goes, Never let your little gun pointed be at anyone. It matters not a damn to me whether or not it loaded be. I beg your pardon, my lord. <laughs> Pray, continue, Mr. Campbell. If your lordship pleases. <laughs> now, Inspector Firth, you've told us about the fingerprints and the revolver and of your arrest of the prisoner. Did you have occasion to question him earlier on another matter? Yes, sir. On January 23rd, Colonel Laird brought his daughter to the station. She then made a complaint to me that she'd been raped by the prisoner in November last. Because of subsequent events, no further action was taken, sir. Quite. Having been taken into custody, did Harper make a written statement? He did, sir. Do you know how I identify the statement? Production number two, right? I do, sir. My lord, I request that the statement be read. Very well. A check from the original, as I read, will you please, Inspector? This is a statement of Alan Harper of the old farm Craig Allen, aged 22 years. I have been cautioned that I'm not obliged to say anything unless I wish to do so, but that anything I do say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. That is signed Alan Harper. The statement reads, perhaps I did shoot her. I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know what happened, and I don't want to answer any more questions or have any more fuss. Anne's dead, and I don't care what happens to me now. Again, that is signed Alan Harper. Thank you, Inspector. That is all. What condition was he in when he made that statement? Shocked? Upset? Frightened? He seems shocked and upset, madam. This may seem a small point, but we may as well get it right. Because Harper's prints on the revolver were over those of the girl and her father, you said he was the last person to handle it. I did, yes. You're assuming rather a lot, aren't you? I don't understand you, madam. Surely you handled the revolver yourself. Your sergeant, the scientific officer. Well, naturally, madam, we had to. Then why aren't your prints on it? Because we always take precautions, madam. Precisely. But if somebody else had taken similar precautions, what then? Then uh, I suppose his prints would not appear. So that Harper may not have been the last person to handle it. That is possible. So that what you told the court earlier was not strictly true, was it? Not strictly, madam, I suppose. I'm sorry. I'm obliged. Now, Harper was not very well liked in the district, was he? No, madam. Cynical, ill-mannered English boy with too much money and a fast sports car who didn't give a damn for anyone. That was about it, wasn't uh, it? So I believe, madam. What about the girl? I would say she was very popular. Local Scots lass, model of all the virtues, loved everyone and whom everyone loved. My lord, for an eminent member of the English bar to appear against me in this court, albeit in the lowly robes of a junior, is a privilege I have not enjoyed before, and I bid her welcome. I'm also prepared to make certain allowances. But, my lord, the inspector is now being asked to express opinions on matters which are no concern of his. My lord, I submit that the relationship of the boy and girl is crucial in my submission. Miss Stanford, you'll have opportunity later to make such comment as you think fit. Now... Proceed to your next point, if you have one. My lord, since I am prevented from conducting the defence in the best interests of my client, I have no further question. Thank you, Inspector. Thank you, Inspector Firth. Call Colonel Laird now, please. Call Colonel Laird! My lord, in view of Colonel Laird's disability, may he be allowed to give his evidence from his chair in the well of the court? Oh, well, I mean, I'm very much obliged, my lord. Ah, 
raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Colonel Laird, is your full name Robert Laird, and do you live at Buckleu House, Woodlands Road, Craigellan? Yes. On February the 7th last, did you attend Afton Bray Mortuary and there identify the body of your daughter, Anne? Yes, yes, I did. Label one, please. Colonel Laird, will you now take a look at this revolver? Have you seen it before? Yes, it's mine. How do you come to have a weapon of that sort? At one time, I was an expert shot. I represented the army. Now it's about the only sport I can follow. Have you ammunition for this revolver? Yes. Did you ever give that revolver to Harper? Certainly not. Could he have taken it without your knowledge? He could have done. How? Well, it wasn't locked up. And he was frequently a visitor of my house, for a time. You say, for a time. Did his visits then cease? They did. About ten days before he killed her. My lord, that is the most improper remark. Colonel Laird, the court appreciates the strain you're under, but you must control yourself. You wish to tell us that the prisoner stopped visiting her house some ten days before your daughter died. I apologise, my lord, that is so. My lord, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I cannot let it pass as easily as that. In front of the jury, the witness has Mr. made the most... Miss Stanford, he has withdrawn the remark. It's all very well, but the damage is done now. Miss Stanford, do not deck her. Mr. Campbell? Colonel Laird, why did Harper stop coming to your house? Anne told me that he was upsetting her. She didn't want to see him anymore, so I told him he was no longer welcome. Were you aware then of the real reasons for her distress? No. Later she told me that he'd, he'd raped her and that she was pregnant. I informed the police. Did she tell you when Harper had raped her, the date? Yes. On the evening of her birthday party, November the 14th. And medical evidence has shown that at the time of her death she was two months pregnant? Yes. Did you ever see Harper handle this revolver? Yes, I did. In my study. He was fooling about with it. I asked him to stop. He just laughed and put it away. Where did he put it away? In the drawer of the bureau. He then locked it and put the key in the other drawer where it's usually kept. What about the ammunition? That is kept in the same drawer as the revolver. Thank you, Colonel Laird. Colonel Laird, you told Harper to keep away from your house. Did he? Yes. What have you been suggesting then? That he took the revolver and the ammunition on an earlier visit in case he might later want to shoot your daughter? Of course not. Then what are you suggesting? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm glad to hear it, because that is precisely what my learned friend has been trying to make you do. Oh, nonsense. If you please. But you didn't miss the revolver and the ammunition, did you? No, not until the police told me. Nor do you know that Harper took them. I suppose not. But for all you know, anyone other than Harper may have taken them. How did he get hold of them? Then? I am asking the questions, Colonel Laird. Anyone could have taken them. Your own daughter, for instance. Well, I suppose so, yes. Yes, Colonel Laird. Now, Anne was very close to Harper at one time, wasn't she? I thought so. So it must have come as a surprise to you when suddenly she said she didn't want to see him again. Did you ask why? Yes. She told me that he was becoming too possessive. So I asked him not to come round anymore. Was he upset? Yes, he was. How did Anne take it? Oh, she was quite determined. Once she'd made up her mind she was finished, she yes, was finished. Yes, she went out to meet him on the night she died. Where were you at the time? At home. And where did you think Anne was? In bed. She went upstairs at about oh, 11 o'clock. And ten minutes later she was dead, having been shot with a heavy service revolver within 30 yards of your house, and yet, Colonel Laird, you heard nothing, not a sound? No. Nope. Would you now look at the police photograph showing your daughter's body where it lay on the grass verge? You will notice in that photograph the tracks made by your wheelchair and the soft ground where your daughter is lying. You didn't by any chance follow her that night? No, I did not. I didn't go out until my friend Major Crookshank told me that he'd found her. Then I wheeled myself out to where she was while he telephoned the police. I couldn't help her. I can't get out of this wheelchair without my crutches. I didn't have them with me. I, I tried all ways. I couldn't even touch her. <coughs> Colonel Laird, your wife died in the same car crash that left you as you are now. That was when Anne was seven years old. So you had to bring her up yourself. Yes. So you were particularly close. Yes, we were. 
Anne was all I had left. We were very happy together. So she used to confide in you. There were no secrets between you. No. And why did she wait nearly two months before telling you she'd been raped? Well, I suppose she was frightened and ashamed. Frightened of you? Of course not. Ashamed of herself, then? Well, why should she be? It wasn't her fault. And nevertheless, she continued to associate closely with Harper until ten days before her death. Well, she was fond of him. She didn't want to get him into trouble. But you've already told us that she wanted to be rid of him, that she was tired of him, and she certainly did get him into trouble. Yes, well, I insisted when I found out what had happened. Two months after this so-called rape? No, Colonel Laird. This boy is accused of murdering your daughter. The motive, the only motive put forward by the Crown, is that she had accused him of raping her. But from what you've just told me, the question of rape doesn't arise, does it? Yes, it does. If Anne said so, then it was so. Colonel Laird, I put it to you that Anne was never raped by Harper. On the contrary, this was an act of love between them, of love initiated by her. No. I further suggest that far from confiding in you, she was ashamed to do so. And when her pregnancy became certain, she invented this story to protect herself from your anger. That isn't true. And could it be that you were jealous? Jealous of your daughter and her relationship with this boy? Certainly not. That idea is grotesque. Is it? Study the Barretts of Wimpole Street and the unhealthy relationship in that unhappy family. That is a disgusting suggestion. You have no right to make such a... Infer My such Lord, a I must protest most strongly. I've finished. Thank you, Colonel Laird. Colonel Laird, for some reason best known to herself, my learned friend from the South has chosen to ignore the proprieties usually observed at a Scottish court and to assume that attack is the best means of defence, even where no defence exists. No more comment, Mr Campbell, please. However, so that there should be no doubt left in the minds of the jury as to the real truth, is there any substance in the suggestions put to you? Of course not. None at all. Thank you, Colonel Laird. Call Valerie Gowan, please. Call Valerie Gowan. Valerie Gowan, who are you, madam? I'm her mother. Are you a witness in the case? No, but my daughter is nervous. I'd like to stay in court with her. What is the delay? The colonel is nervous, my lord. Her mother wishes to stay with her. No, no objection to that. Bring your daughter here to the well of the court, ma'am, where I can see her. Now then, Valerie, is it? There's nothing to be nervous about, Valerie. All you have to do is to tell the truth. You understand? Good. Then you go into the witness box there and... You, Mrs. Gowan, will find a seat at the back. Now then, Valerie, hold up your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. Speak up a little so everyone can hear. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. That's better. That I shall tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I shall tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Gently, Mr. Campbell. My lord, of course. Valerie, how old are you? Sixteen and a half. Sixteen and a half. Miss Stanford, there can be no dispute in her evidence. If, with your permission, I may lead. Certainly, Mr. Campbell. On your assurance that in giving it, I do not offend the proprieties usually observed in this court. I'm most grateful. Now, Valerie, I'm going to ask you some questions, and all you have to do is answer yes or no. Good. And you will speak up so that we can all hear you? Yes, I'll try. That's better. Now, you knew Anne Laird, didn't you? Yes. She was a classmate of yours and a friend. Yes. And you were with her on the morning of the day she was killed. Yes. Did she say something to you about meeting the prisoner, Alan Harper, that night? She said she was going to meet Alan, to finish it once and for all. Thank you, Valerie. That's all. Pretty much obliged, Miss Stanford. Not at all. Valerie, Anne was your best friend, wasn't she? Yes. So she must have talked to you about Alan? Yes. Well, you don't seem very sure. Yes, I am sure, only she didn't say much. I see. What sort of girl was Anne? Tell me, please. She was all right. All right? Is that all you can say about her, that she was all right? Yes. But she was a lively gay girl, wasn't she? Well, she was. And she liked going out with Alan, didn't she? I don't know. Well, what about other boys? Did she ever talk about them? No. But Anne was popular, wasn't she, with boys and girls? Yes. Then did she not have any other boyfriends besides Alan? Not that I know of. Valerie, can you think of anyone who might have wanted to harm her? Only Alan. But Alan loved her, didn't he? So he said. Did you like Alan? It was all right. Uh, did he ever ask you to go out with him? Yes, once, but I wouldn't. Why not? 
wouldn't have been right. Valerie, what did you talk about, you and Anne, when you were alone together? Lots of things. What? School? Clothes? Makeup? Yes. What else? Records, cinema, television, that sort of thing. Boys? Sex? No. But you know about sex, don't you? We didn't talk about such things. Valerie, you must listen to me very carefully. I want to be quite sure you understand. Now, Anne was your best friend. Yet you never discussed boys or sex. She hardly ever talked to you about Alan. She never told you she was going to say he'd raped her. And she never told you she was going to have a baby. Is that what you expect us to believe? Yes, it is. Valerie, you did go out alone once with Alan, didn't you? Soon after you and Anne first met him. I didn't. Valerie, why aren't you telling me the truth? I am. Just now you swore a solemn oath before God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, didn't you? Yes. But it doesn't mean a thing to you. You don't care what happens to Alan, do you? Not so long as you can protect yourself. I'm not protecting myself. Then who are you protecting? No one, no one. Even now you are still lying, aren't you? I'm not, I'm not. Stop it, stop it, leave it alone. <laughs> My lord, on behalf of the crowd, I must protest most strongly against such treatment of a juvenile witness. I agree, Miss Stanford. I will allow no further cross-examination of this girl. Mr. Campbell, call your next witness. My lord, surely I'm not to be deprived of the right to conclude Miss my... Miss Stanford, you heard what I said. You will ask her no further questions. Then, my lord, perhaps I may be permitted to address myself to your lordship. My lord, I suggest that this girl is lying and that she is deliberately withholding evidence of vital importance. Miss Stanford, please sit down. My lord, I insist upon being heard. The girl understands she is on oath. She must know she is doing wrong. Her mother is in court. Let her speak to her daughter. If the girl commits perjury, then her parents are as morally responsible as she is. Let them ask her why she is lying. My lord! Let them get at the truth that a Scottish court will not allow me to do so. Miss Stanford, for the last time, I order you to sit down. You ran it very close just now. One more word and I think the judge would have had the gown off you. Don't leave and abused his authority. He must have seen the girl was holding something back. I dare say Campbell's pleased enough. Alistair, we've got to get Valerie Garn back in the box. Where's Adrian? Soothing that Mrs. Harper. She thinks we're not giving value for money. Damn the woman. What does she want? A ticket with not guilty on one side and a weight on the other? Well, I've got Connell settled. Now, what are we going to do about Valerie Garn? She's scared of something. Or lying about something, and I'm scared Dunleavin's going to make us miss it. Alistair, what's the Garn family like? The father's a solicitor. Highly respectable. Do you know him? Only by repute. It's a pity he wasn't in court. He should have been. He might have had his eyes opened. Well, the mother was there. She must be telling her husband what went on this very minute. I should hope so. Right. Then that's the way to get past Dunleavin. Alistair, will you get Garn on the phone? But what in the world am I going to say to the man? Tell him his daughter is perverting the course of justice. I wouldn't dare. Julia, it's too tricky. Tricky be damned. Bend your ethics for once. If we don't get Valerie Garn back in the box before Campbell closes his case, we haven't a hope in hell. I'll try. I don't like it one little bit. I only hope you're right. Well, we really are clutching at straws, aren't we? Adrian, if we could get the answers to three questions. No, four. What questions? We might be getting somewhere. One, why is Valerie Garn scared? Two, is she lying? Three, why was Alan Harper accused of rape? And four, who really shot that girl? Well, come in, Alan. I'll see you later. You look tired. Sit down. Alan, I have some questions to ask you. Yeah. How well do you know Valerie Gowan? Well, not very well. I never liked her and she never liked me. Why didn't you like her? Oh, I don't know. She was always whispering, uh, having private jokes with her. I, I think she resented me. Why was she lying this morning? Well, I suppose she was frightened. Of the court? No. In case you asked her something nasty. What, for instance? Oh, sex, of course. Oh, and she said she didn't talk about it with Anne. Oh, that was rich. Why lie about it? 
Oh, playing the wee innocent in front of mummy. Sex is dirty. It makes Valerie blush. All that kind of jerks. Does sex make Valerie blush? Not so you've noticed. Alan, you've had intercourse with Valerie, haven't you? Yes. It was before I fell in love with her. Well, I never slept with Valerie afterwards. I see. That explains a lot. You know, Alan, it would help a great deal if you could remember more of what you did after you took the gun from Anne. I'm sorry. Somehow I have to explain your loss of memory to the court. Oh, look, it's a waste of time. They're going to find me guilty anyway. Don't talk like that. Well, I don't care, you know. Honestly. Alan, will you stop this? It would be bad enough coming from anybody but a boy of your age with your whole life in front of you. It's weak, unhealthy and gutless. Oh, it must be nice to be so self-sufficient. I'm not. I've tried. I'm being sorry for yourself. That doesn't work either. And you ever feel sorry for yourself? It's a luxury I allow myself occasionally. Oh, it's one my mother allows herself most of the time. What a struggle it's all been, what a beast my father was, what a nuisance I am, and what a burden the business is. It's pathological, really. She's surrounded by people who work for her. She pays them to. So what's she got to worry about? She takes the responsibility. Like you do. That's not a true parallel. You know, as long as I can remember, she's never been there when I've wanted her. I never time for anything. And when she's at home, nobody ever comes near. Except to her stupid parties. Not even her boyfriend. Why not? Well, they're business expenses. Brush them under the hotel carpet. A bed and breakfast for two, please, and charge it to the company. And she still thinks I don't know. Do you know what I think's going to happen to my mother? I think she's going to go on and on working because she can't stop. And then, and then one day she'll wake up, quite dead. Just a wealthy, redundant old tart with nothing to do and lonely as hell. You think that's me too? <laughs> well, I'm never likely to be all that wealthy. And I don't see myself as a tart, redundant or otherwise. But you could be lonely. For that, one doesn't have to be old, does one? Julia, yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt, but Gowan's left for his branch office on Strathray. He's on the road somewhere. Well, what about the girl and her mother? Not a sign. They could be having lunch somewhere or be on their way home. Well, how soon can you contact Gowan? Not before half past two, and then he's got to talk to the girl and get her here, if he and will. And how long will all that take? I need every minute I can get. Adrian? How many Crown witnesses are there left? Uh, five. Two short, three purely formal. Say, 20 minutes normal working? Oh, barely. All right, Alistair. At the risk of being disbarred, I'll guarantee you 90. Right. Only for God's sake, find Gowan. You just can't win, can you? Call Mr. Miller, please. Call Mr. Miller. Miss Stanford. My lord. It's become increasingly obvious that for some reason best known to yourself, you're deliberately wasting the court's time. My lord, I'm afraid I don't understand. You understand me perfectly. Since two o'clock, you've spent, by my reckoning, no less than one hour and a quarter in cross-examining three purely formal witnesses whom any competent junior could have dealt with in as many minutes. Am I to infer that your lordship considers me an incompetent junior? That, Miss Stanford, is a matter for you. My lord, I must ask to be allowed to handle my case as I see fit. Certainly. Provided that what you see fit is what I see fit. But I will tolerate no more of these delaying tactics. You will confine your questions to the point at issue. Is that clear? Quite clear, my lord. Thank Very well, then see so you do. Mr. Campbell. Uh, Mr. Miller, please go to the box. Raise your right. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr. Miller, is your full name George Baxter Miller, and are you a dealer in wines and spirits, and you live at Glen Shee Woodlands Road, Craig Ellen? That's quite correct. Do you recall the night of February the 6th of this year? I do indeed. I recall it very well. That was the night of our society's annual dinner. Uh, I belong to the Vintners, you know, and we have a wee get-together once a year. Well, a simple yes or no will suffice. I thought that's what I was doing, telling you how I was sure it was February the 6th. Mm. At what time did you retire to bed that night? Oh, uh, a bit after 11, I suppose. 
Hey, you want it as close as possible? Within the limits of human fallibility, Mr. Miller. Uh, well, now, uh, let me think. Uh, we get back for uh, about uh, 20 minutes to 11. Uh, we left the dinner early. Wife wasn't feeling too well. She'd, uh... Ah, well, after all, it's a vintner's dinner. Anyway, I put her to bed. A simple answer. I'm working it out for you. Say, uh, 11.15. No, no, it's a bit more than that. Say, 11.20. No, no, no. Say 11.15. Mr. Miller, counsel asked you for simple answers. That means a straight yes or no where no qualification is necessary and a short reply where it is. Do you consider you're given simple answers? Yes, my lord. They're digging for me, you're not. I see, my lord. I was only... I, 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 I did. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Miller, very briefly, please. Before retiring, what did you do? I gave the wife a blue powder. But you gave your wife the blue powder and then... She passed out, stone cold. And then? I wound up the clock. What time was the clock showing? Ten to eleven. Having wound up the clock, what did you do? Set the alarm for half past six. And then? I had my bath. Ah, oh, you had your bath. Yeah. And while you were having your bath, did anything unusual happen? I thought I heard a shot. What do you mean you thought you heard a shot? Either he heard it or you didn't hear it. I heard a crack and I thought it was a shot. What made you think it was a shot? My lord, I was with girls all through the war. I've had enough shots to last me for a lifetime. I know a shot when I hear one. Uh, why didn't you say so before? Why did you say you thought you had a shot? Because my ears were full of soap. I had to think to make sure. And what did you made sure? What did you do? Do nothing. You just sat in your bar thinking. No, I just sat still listening. If you splash about, you can't hear anything. I would have thought anybody could see that, eh? And what were you listening for? More shots. And did you hear any more? No, that was what was so funny. Funny? Why was it funny? Well, uh, I'm used to the Colonel. Uh, Colonel Laird, that is, practising with his revolver. But it's usually a whole series of shots. And is he in the habit of practising at 11 o'clock at night? Oh, no, no. I uh, uh, would never disturb the neighbourhood after dark, especially on the Sabbath. Well, since you didn't think it was the Colonel, what did you think? Rabbits. What did you say? The woods are lifting with rabbits, my lord. I'd seen some tinkers earlier in the day, and I thought maybe they were getting themselves a dinner. Of a single rabbit? And they're big rabbits. <laughs> Did you hear anything else? Yes, I did, in maybe about uh, half a minute. I thought I, foot I heard uh, footsteps running. One of the larger rabbits, no doubt. Did you connect in your mind the shot with the footsteps? Of course. It was as if someone had fired and then run away. Someone fired and then ran away. Approximately what time was it you heard the shot? I don't know. I, uh, I got out of the bath and I dried myself and I took my pyjamas on. Mr. Miller, there's no happy medium. Ten past eleven, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Not at all. Miss Stanford, I remind both you and the witness of my earlier warning. It is still clearly in my mind, my lord. Mr. Miller, I am sure, was only anxious to assist the court, as indeed was I. That was my intention, yes. Alas, Mr. Miller, we are both misunderstood. This shot, when you heard it, you took no action beyond sitting and listening in your bar? Oh, yes, I did. When I got out of my bath, I looked out the bedroom window. What did you see? Nothing. Well, what did you do then? I went to bed. Uh, I had to get up early, you see. I see. Mr. Miller, your house is about twice as far from the road as Colonel Laird's, is it not? About less than twice. You have trees, too, whereas Colonel Laird has an open lawn running down to his road frontage. That's right. Very fine lawn it is, too. Is your hearing acute, Mr. Miller? I'm not deaf. And sitting, splashing in your bath with your ears full of soap, you still heard this shot? Yes, I did. Yet Colonel Laird, whose house is twice as near, whose fine lawn is devoid of trees masking it, and who presumably had no soap in his ears, he didn't hear a thing. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> Nor has anyone else come forward to say they heard a shot, although there are several houses no further away than yours. If Colonel Laird and the others didn't hear the shot, then they, they must be either deaf or daft. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Call Major Kruchek, please. Oh, Major Crooks. This is my last witness, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. This way, please. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Major Crookshank. Is your full name Duncan Mather Cruikshank, and are you a retired army officer and now resident secretary of Craigellan Country Club? Yes. Did you know Anne Laird? Yes, she was my godchild. 
You also know the prisoner? As a member of the club, yes. Do you recall the night of February the 6th of this year? I do. Did you see the prisoner on that night? I saw him at about 11 o'clock in the evening. Where? I'd been out. I was driving back to the club when I saw his car parked near the corner of Woodlands Road. He was waiting for Anne. How do you know that? Because she joined him at that moment. I knew Anne and her father had been to the police and why, and that she was forbidden to talk to him. And what did you do? I was rather disturbed, but I didn't like to, to spy on them. So I went back to the club. But then I felt there was something wrong. So I turned round and drove back. And what did you find? She, Anne, was lying on the grass beside the road where I'd last seen her with them. Um, then what did you do? I could see that she was dead, so I went straight to our house and telephoned the police. Thank you, Major Cruikshank. Do you dislike Harper? Uh, yes, I do. And was that feeling pretty general? It was. Major Cruikshank, I'm sure you're not an unfair man. What caused him to be so much disliked? He was arrogant, didn't give a damn for anyone. I had endless complaints. From the members, the older ones? Mostly, yes. And from the younger ones? No. Why not? Well, they used to admire him, I suppose. He had plenty of money, a fast car, a smart clothes. All the sort of things that appeal to the young today. Then Harper's money brought him a spurious popularity among the younger members. You could say that, yes. Especially among the girls? Yes, though, to be fair, he didn't encourage them. You mean they chased him? Oh, quite shamelessly, yes. How about Anne? Did he change after he met her? He did improve a little. He seemed less rude, happier. Yes. In fact, it was obvious that he'd fallen head over heels in love with her, wasn't it? Yes. Did you approve? Certainly not. When you heard about the charge of rape, what was your reaction? I was horrified. I could scarcely keep my hands off it. In that case, when you saw them together that night, why didn't you do something about it? I didn't have the authority. I'm not her father. Why didn't you tell her father he was in the house? I wish to God I had, but it was so late. I thought he'd be in bed. Too late to wake him? Yes, I, I, I intended to tell him the next morning. But you went back that night. Why? I've already said I felt there was something wrong. What did you intend to do? Speak to her father, face Anne with him. But it was even later by then. There was no reason why Anne should still have been there. Well, it was a feeling I had, a sort of sixth sense. I felt there was something wrong. Or did you really know? No. Why not should I? How could I possibly have known she was dead? How oh, indeed. Thank you, Major Cruikshank. Thank you, Major Cruikshank. That concludes the case for the Crown, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Yes, Miss Stanford. May it please you, my lord. Now, what is it, Miss Stanford? My lord, with respect before calling my client, I beg leave to make a submission to your lordship. Yes, very well. What is it? On your lordship's direction, I was not able to conclude my cross-examination of Valerie Garn. My lord, I have been informed that the girl and her mother have left the court and are nowhere to be found. Well? My lord, could it not be that my remarks of this morning, to which your lordship took exception, have struck home that the girl has indeed something to hide and has now herself gone into hiding? Uh, Miss Sanford, I have already ruled against you on this point. My lord, I have not forgotten. It is only by reason of my own obstinacy that I now address you. My lord... I submit that Valerie Gowan is a key witness whose disappearance at this stage is suspect. I formally ask your lordship to order a search to be made for her and the case to stand adjourned. Miss Stanford, your obstinacy does you no credit. You are permitted to think the same of mine. I rule against you a second time. So be it, my lord. Harper, will you go into the witness box, please? <coughs> Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. And as I shall answer to God at the great day of judgment. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Harper, your full name is Alan Harper, and prior to your arrest, you were living with your mother at the old farm, Craig Elden. Yes. Would it be true to say that there has never been any proper understanding between you and your mother? Yes. And you never knew your father? No. So that from an early age you've had to rely upon yourself alone? Yes. More recently, was there any person for whom you were able to feel affection? 
Was there? Only I. And before her? No one. Did you mind being so alone? There seemed no alternative. Until you met Anne? Yes. Did you love her very much? Yes, I did. Did she love you? Yes. Did you ask her to marry you? Yes. Did she accept you? Yes. Did you rape her? No. Did you have intercourse with her? Yes. How often? Only once. Anne wanted to prove how much we meant to one another. Afterwards, did her attitude towards you change? Not at first. Not until about a week before she was killed. What happened then? She just stopped seeing me. She said she didn't want to see me anymore as if she didn't care anymore. Have you any idea why? I didn't then, but I see why now. Why? Well, her father. She was frightened and worried about the trouble that'd be with the baby. Well, he didn't think much of me, and then there was what people would say. Did you know then about the baby? No, she didn't tell me. Oh, well, she had. It would have all been different. How different? Oh, well, we could have got married straight away. Instead of that, she, she went round the bend and said she didn't want to see me anymore. I told her father I'd raped her. What happened on February the 6th? She phoned me and asked me to meet her that night at the usual place at about 11, after her father had gone to bed. Oh, she sounded happy and warm. I like her normal stuff. When you went to meet her, what did you expect? I thought everything was going to be all right. And when you did meet her, what happened? She gave me one of her father's guns. She gave you a revolver. Then what happened? Well, I'd once said I, I couldn't live without her. I, I was pretty corny, I suppose, but that's how I felt anyway. She reminded me of it and said that it was the best way out. The discarded lover's exit. And she laughed. Was it a joke? Not the way she said it, no. She, she was quite serious, just holding out this gun, laughing, sneering at me, telling me to take it. What did you do? I, I, I don't know. I, did I don't you know. take the revolver? Oh, well, no, not exactly. She sort of put the gun in my hand. Uh, oh, 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 but I threw it away. I, I, I'm sure I remember throwing it away because there wasn't any shot. Well, if there wasn't any shot, I, I couldn't have shot her, could I? What did she do? She just stood there, uh, laughing. And she called me a coward. Uh, well, I couldn't understand it. it. It wasn't like her anymore. She was such a bitch. What did you do then? I ran away. Oh, it was so stupid. I, I thought she must have been playing some sort of game. Where did you go? Oh, look, I don't know. I can't remember. I just ran into the woods somewhere, anywhere. Then after a bit, I suppose I, I calmed down. And I, I thought I'd go back and try and talk to her. Alan, it was so stupid. I, I, I thought she must have been playing some sort of game. I, Alan, when you got back there, what did you see? It was horrible. Anne was lying there on the, on the ground, and there was blood, blood all over. Did you ever form any intent to kill her? No, I loved her. If you had thought there was any chance of her being in any way injured, would you have ever agreed to meet her that night? No, I loved her. Thank you. When you ran away, in what direction did you run? Into the woods. You simply wanted to get away from this bitch, as you called her. Oh, yes. Then why run? Your car was round the corner. Why not drive away? Oh, I didn't think of it. I didn't even think what I was doing. But you could think sufficiently to go back and talk to her, couldn't you? Oh, well, yes. Well, well, that was later, because I couldn't believe she meant what she'd said. But a moment ago, you said she was serious. She meant it. I meant she wasn't joking. It, it, it's difficult to explain. Perhaps I can help. Perhaps you never ran away at all that night. Oh, yes, I did. When? Before you shot her or after? I didn't shoot her. D didn't you? But you keep saying you don't remember. In your statement to the police, you admit you could have killed her. Why did you say that? I was sick of answering questions. I, I didn't know what I was saying. They, they just kept on and on at me. Did I, they? We have heard a great deal about this love of yours for Anne Laird. But you never really loved her at all, did you? Oh, yes, I did. Well, how could you have done? On your own admission, you left her there bleeding and injured on the roadside. Oh, there was nothing I could do. She was dead. How do you know? Why, why I, I, I just knew. I, 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 I'm sure she was. Why? Because you had already made sure she was? Oh, no. Then how? Well, 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 well she, 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 she looked dead. The moon may look as if it's made of green cheese, but common sense tells us it is probably not. Oh, yeah, yes, I, I, I know. Didn't that. your common sense tell you that although Anne Laird looked dead, there was nevertheless a possibility, however remote, that she was still living? If, as you say, you loved her, surely your first reaction would be to run for help, a doctor, an ambulance, the police. But you did none of these things. Oh, well, no, I, I, I was frightened. It, it was all so horrible, I didn't even think. Think about what? How you could get away with it, where you could run to, where to hide? No! 
Why didn't you tell the police? Oh, I did. Two hours later, after you'd been picked up. I was going to the police. Two hours after the murder, up on the hills, going in the opposite direction. Oh, you're just twisting everything I say now. When this girl threw you over, you set out to revenge yourself. No. You stole that revolver, intending to shoot her. I did And didn't. you got her to meet you that night so that you could kill her. I didn't. I told you the truth. I'm a god safe. You believe. killed Anne Lair. No, I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. Answer me. <laughs> Who does? <laughs> Tell me the truth. None too well, I'm afraid. Alistair, I think we ought to consider carefully your talk with the Procurator Fiscal. Julie is not going to be too happy about that. No doubt, but since the offer's been made, we must consider it. I don't understand. What offer? That we don't fight anymore and that we change our plea to one of guilty of culpable homicide. Or as we call it, manslaughter. Manslaughter? Well, that's to say that although Alan didn't mean to kill the girl, his action was neither accidental nor justifiable. The sentence would be five years, perhaps less. Five years in prison for a crime he didn't commit? Well, that's the problem. Or do we go on with our plea of not guilty and risk a life sentence if we lose? Thank God for a hot bath. Alistair, do your spies know where we are? They do. I have a lad in each of Gowan's offices, my secretary waiting on his doorstep. All on overtime? Unfortunately. Then you better charge it to Dunleven. <laughs> I think I'll give Gowan's home number a ring just the same. Thank you, Adrian. I need that. Well, now, what's the interim analysis? Oh, it's a great pity the boy didn't stand up to Campbell. It did us terrible harm. You mean he's as good as admitted that he killed the girl? But he didn't. We know he didn't. Unfortunately, the jury does not. How was he now? I talked to him. He's calmed down. That was my fault, largely. I should have prepared him better. They're still not answering. Oh, where the hell are they? People don't just disappear in circumstances like these. Julia, hmm? Alistair had a word with the procurator fiscal after court. Oh? I didn't know. What about? He suggested that even at this late stage, if we put in a plea of culpable homicide, he'd accept it. Are you suggesting that we should? I think we should consider it. And I agree. Why? Now look, Julia, suppose we don't find this backdoor approach to the Gowan girl. Or suppose you can't cross-examine anyway because of Dunleven. You're being very faint-hearted, aren't you? The girl can be made now, to talk. Now, just wait a minute and listen. Or suppose, alternatively, that we do get hold of Valerie Gowan and break her and then find she has nothing of value to offer, that whatever it is she's hiding is quite useless to us. Wouldn't it be safer to cut our losses and plead guilty to the lesser charge? I agree. But he's not guilty. Well, that's what I said. Alistair, do you believe the boy killed Anne Laird? All I know is he practically admitted it in open court. And isn't that how the jury will see it? Never mind the jury for the moment. Adrian, what about you? No, I don't believe he killed her. Then someone else did. But we can't prove it. Why not? Somebody must Look, be Adrian, please. even as things stand, we can get a verdict of culpable homicide. If we couldn't, the Crown would never have offered to accept the plea. Even if Valerie Garn's no use, she may still give us a lead. Why give up now and forego a possible acquittal? Well, based on what? I mean, what new evidence have we to swing a jury? What possible doubt can we create? I don't know until I get at that girl. Precisely. That's why it's too risky. In my opinion, it's a risk worth taking. Julia, you really have got yourself emotionally involved with the boy, haven't you? Isn't that what you wanted in the first place? I know I should have remained completely detached, but it's too late for that now. I'm sorry, Julia. I agree it's my fault, but I know you'll do your best in all the circumstances. And just what are those circumstances? That Alan Harper is likely to be found guilty of a crime he didn't commit. In that case, at least his conscience will be clear. But for us deliberately to plead guilty when we know he's not, that's something quite different. So what are we supposed to do? Jail the boy for life just to keep his conscience clear? Very well, Adrian. You are instructing me. Then we plead guilty to culpable homicide. He should get off with about five years. <laughs> Carl, I think you ought to go back to the hotel now and get some rest. We have a lot to do. Hmm? Adrian, there's just one thing. I shall have to call Mrs. Harper in mitigation of the sentence. Would you like me to explain to her now the kind of questions I shall be asking and why? Yes, of course. <laughs> Mrs. Harper, in court, 
After Alan's plea has been accepted, I shall be doing everything I can to emphasise how badly Anne treated him, how upset he was, and so on. I quite understand. In order to gain sympathy, I shall have to put you in the witness box and ask a lot of embarrassing questions. Well, I don't mind at all if it will help. It won't be pleasant. I shall try to show that you've not been the best of mothers and that he was deprived of a father's influence oh, and control. His father wouldn't have done him any good. He was a beast. He'd have been a vile influence. Mrs Harper, do you consider you've been a good mother? I've always given him everything. Everything that money could buy. Was that an adequate substitute for your own care and understanding? Miss Stanford, I've had a struggle to get on. I've had to provide for both of us. I've had to work. What you is, you've always been too busy to bother with him. Adrian, you know I've done my best. Oh, Tell her. I don't want Adrian's opinion. From what I've heard, you haven't been a mother at all. You've let the boy drag himself up and you've taught him to hate his father. I don't see why I should listen to any more of this. Don't you? It's what I'm going to say in court. I think you should be prepared for it. She's quite right, Coral. You've got to stand up to it. I see. Then I'm not at all sure I'm willing to go through with it. I appear to have proved my point. Yes, who is it? Miss Stanford? Yes? I'm told you were wanting to see me. My name is Gowan. I'm Valerie Gowan's father. These two references are marked for you here and here should give you all the ammunition you need. Well done, Alistair. I shall enjoy that. Then we're agreed. Agreed. Well, here are the photostats. These figures and these. I should have warned him. He's far too young and vulnerable to have his illusions publicly shattered. You can still change the plea if you like. I'm not stopping you. No. Then don't sentimentalize and get on with it. Alan's young. He'll get over it. I wish I could be so sure. Mr. Stanford! The Procurator Fiscal tells me he's been in touch concerning a possible change of plea. He has, but we've decided to fight on. Indeed. In your place, I don't know that I should. You're quite sure? Quite sure, Mr. Campbell. My grandmother was a MacDonald. <laughs> Court! Stanford. My lord. You, uh, you're doubtless aware of what I'm about to say to you. A public reprimand to counsel is no light matter, and it is the more regrettable in view of your standing at the English bar. Your conduct in this court yesterday was quite inexcusable. The effect of your indiscretion upon your own reputation is of minor importance, but its effect upon the dignity of this court is absolute. Please understand that I will tolerate no further exhibitions of this sort and try to conduct yourself in a manner befitting your profession and your status. Your Lordship is always so kind. Now proceed with your case. If your Lordship pleases. But before doing so, may I bring two matters to the attention of your Lordship? Yes, very well. My Lord, the first, since it concerns my own reputation, is of minor importance. Nevertheless, may I refer your Lordship to page 89 of the Scottish Law Journal, 1951? Just read out what it says, Mr. My Lord, the section referred to is a verbatim transcript of an exchange between the trial judge, Lord Ogilvy, and learned counsel for the defence. The passage reads, Lord Ogilvy, Mr. Dunleven, for the last time, I order you to resume your seat and stop turning my court into a bear garden. Mr. Dunleavy, my lord, in the cause of justice, I am prepared to risk my name, my career, my future, but I will not be browbeaten into accepting this evidence. With respect, my lord, before being raised to your present high eminence, were you not at that time the Mr. Dunleavy referred to? What is your next point, Miss Stanford? My lord, I venture to suggest that this is of absolute importance in that it concerns the reputation of this court. Well. Lord Advocate versus Monroe, my lord, on a conviction for culpable homicide. Appeal reports, volume three, 1955. Conviction quashed on appeal on the grounds of misdirection by the trial judge. The circumstances of the case were these, my lord, that during the course of the trial and on the direction of the trial judge, defending counsel was unable to conclude his cross-examination of a certain witness by reason of the fact. My Stanford, I am already uh, aware of the circumstances. If your lordship pleases. Mr. Campbell, you will recall the girl 
Valerie Gowan. If your lordship pleases, Mr. Campbell, the Campbell, you heard what I said. Recall her. Call Valerie Gowan, please. Call Valerie Gowan. My lord, I would ask that her parents be permitted to remain in court with her. Oh, very well. Valerie, you have already taken the oath. Yes. But yesterday you didn't tell us the truth, did you? Please say so out loud. No, no, I didn't. Would you now tell us the truth exactly as you told your father last night in front of me and this gentleman? Yes. You knew Anne was going to have a baby, didn't you? Yes. Did she tell you who the father was? No. She didn't tell you it was Alan Harper's baby? No. Did she tell you she'd had intercourse with him? Yes. How many times? Only once with him. Only once with him. So there were others? Yes, a lot. Were they boys or men? Oh, men. She really only liked older men. Oh, that's a lie! Harper! Oh, it's not it's not true! Harper, sit down! Valerie, do you know why Anne preferred older men? She said they were more experienced and they all had money. They were easier to deal with. Easier to deal with? They all had wives and families. They had more to lose. So once they had become involved with her, and blackmailed these men? Yes. Valerie, have you had intercourse with a man? Yes. Were you in love with him? No. Then why did you? Anne dared me. If Anne only liked older men, why did she bother with Alan? To annoy the other girls at school. Anyway, Alan had money and he was easy. Easy? How do you mean, easy? He was crazy about her. All the other girls dripped over him. Anne played it cool. In the end, she hooked him. So it was all just a game to her. She didn't care if Alan got hurt or not. No, she used to laugh about it. These other men, did they all give her money? Yes, of course. What did you do with it? Did she spend a lot? She couldn't without being found out. She had to save it. She had a checkbook and everything. Thank you. That is all. My lord, I ask no questions in re-examination. My lord, in view of what we've heard, I respectfully ask leave to recall other prosecution witnesses for further cross-examination. Uh, have you any objection, Mr. Campbell? My lord, none, if they're by the cause of justice is served. Isn't that why we are here, Mr. Campbell? Yes, very well, Mr. Major Crookshank, please. Call Major Crookshank. <coughs> Major Crookshank, you are already on oath. Yes. You've told us that Anne Laird was your goddaughter. Uh, she was, yes. Did you take your responsibility seriously? I believe so, yes. Then you were close to her personally. Would you say that next to her father, you knew her better than anyone? Oh, yes. Then tell me, who were the men in her life? Men? What men? Evidence has been laid before this court that Anne had indulged in sexual intercourse with different men on many occasions. I don't believe it. Would you admit that you know more about the behavior of this sweet and innocent child than you would care to discuss with her father? Certainly not. I resent your question. As you please. Major Cruikshank, at what stage did your relationship with the girl change from that of godfather to that of lover? Well, Major Cruikshank? There was never anything like that. Did you ever give her money? Well, sometimes, yes. How much? Shillings? Pounds? Well, a few pounds. Five pounds? Ten pounds? I suppose so. Never more? Considerably more? No. I see. Then would you please look at these documents? Look at them. Those checks are your checks, aren't they? You gave her all that money, didn't you? Yes. It is my duty to warn you that you are not obliged to say anything that might incriminate yourself. Would you tell the court how you came to give her all that money, or would you rather I called witnesses? I'll tell you myself. Thank you. My lord, the documents can be proved in due course. However, the witness has identified them, so I see no reason why they should not be admitted in evidence. They will be productions five, six, and seven, my lord. Let me have them up. As your lordship will see, they are certified copies of the bank statements of Anne Laird and Major Crookshank. They show four entries of particular interest. One of 25 pounds, two of 50, one of 75 pounds. The cheques payable to cash and signed by Major Crookshank were paid by Anne Laird into her own account. 
Now, Major Crookshank, perhaps you will answer my previous question. When did you first become her lover? About... about a year ago. Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, it's a lie. Harper, be silent. Oh. I shall not warn you again. If your lordship pleases. Will you please tell us how this affair began? Well, Anne was always a physically attractive child. More advanced for her years. She knew somehow. She, she, she used to provoke me deliberately. I was there one day. She, she came and sat on my knee. Were you alone? Oh, no, no. Her father was in the room. We were watching television. So she sat on your knee. Did you enjoy that? But it, it was very embarrassing. She, she, she put her arms around me. I, I, I thought she wanted to whisper something. She kissed my ear. What is so singular about that? It was the way she did it with her tongue. Sexually? Oh, yes. So what did you do? Well, I, I, I didn't want to make a fuss. Eventually, I, I got free and left. You didn't tell her father? I felt I couldn't. I, I thought I could deal with it myself. And did you? I tried, but she, she, she just laughed. I said she knew I liked it. And that if I told her father, she'd say I'd started it. But that wouldn't have been true. Oh, of course not. But knowing Anne, she'd have told such a convincing story, her father would have believed it. What happened after that? She, she told me her father would be out late. She asked me to go back to the house. And you went? She blackmailed me into it. Child of that age? Child, she wasn't a child. She was a precocious young woman. But you couldn't resist her, could you? No. One moment. Is uh, the young man all right? Go on. Thank you, my lord. So this girl achieved complete domination over you. Sex, blackmail, money. Yes, it was mostly money she wanted, though. You probably weren't the only one. Were there other men in her life? Oh, yes. Do you know any of them personally? I can't tell you about that. Well... I shall not press you further on that point. Anne Laird was, in fact, a vicious, blackmailing young harlot without conscience or scruples. Yes, yes, she was. She wasn't. It's not true. Now, why do you have to go and drag it out? Oh. lies! Oh. <laughs> the common pattern of blackmail is this. There comes a time when the victim is no longer able or willing to pay. The wise man then does what he should have done in the first place. He goes to the police. The foolish one has two choices. To destroy himself or the blackmailer. Was that why you went back to Woodlands Road that night? No. Then why did you go back? Because Miller telephoned me. He told me she was dead. Miss Stafford, I assume you want to hear more from Mr. Miller. I do indeed, my lord. Mr. Miller, go back into the box. <coughs> Major Crookshank, stand up. Oh, God. You will stop in court where I can see you. Mr. Miller, since it obviously means nothing to you, I will not remind you that you are still on oath. Tell the truth this time. You will answer counsel's questions. Mr. Miller, did Anne Laird seduce you and then blackmail you? Yes. On the night in question, did you telephone Major Crookshank and tell him she was dead? Yes, I did die. I didn't know what else to do, you see. Did you kill her? For God's sake, no! You had ample motive and the opportunity. I was in my bath. I had the shot. When I, when I got down there, she was lying on the verge. How? Like this? Look at the photograph. Is that how you found her? More or less. Not more or less, exactly. Uh, and, uh, it wasn't. The, the handbag wasn't like that. It had come open and things were lying on the ground. What made you notice the handbag, particularly? I picked it up. She had some letters of mine. I thought they might be in it. Were they? No. What things were lying about? Well, I didn't notice. Just a woman's things. I, I pushed them back in. Let me have the handbag, please. Checkbook. Was that on the ground? No. Comb? Mirror? Uh, yes, and some loose cut. 
Compact lipstick. Oh, the compact. Handkerchief. Two handkerchiefs. No, uh, one handkerchief. It had blood on it. I put it back. Did you? My lord, may I ask Colonel Laird to identify these? By all means. Colonel Laird, do both those handkerchiefs belong to your daughter? This one, the one with A on it. The clean one, in fact. Yes. Now, please look at the other handkerchief. It is stained not with blood, as Mr. Miller thought, but with lipstick. Did you ever see Anne use such a color? No. My lord, I ask leave to question Valerie Gowan once again. Valerie Gowan, go back into the witness box. Just on the last stand down. Valerie, have you a handkerchief with you? Yes. Take it out and wipe your mouth. Now let me have it. They're both the same, aren't they? They're both your handkerchiefs with your lipstick on them. Yes. Then how did this one come to be lying beside Anne's body? I lent it to her earlier. A dirty handkerchief when she already had a clean one? It was in the morning. Well, if you lent her yours, you didn't have a handkerchief. I had another. Do you always carry two handkerchiefs? Sometimes. Let me see your second one. I haven't got one today. You didn't have a second one that day either. You only had one handkerchief, this one. I ask you once again, how did it come to be lying beside Anne's body? I don't know. I suppose it fell out of her bag. Did it? Let's try with my handbag, shall we? You see? Handkerchiefs don't just fall out of handbags. Heavier things do, but not handkerchiefs. You have to get them out. That's a trick. Just anyway, because yours didn't, it doesn't... No, but the truth is you never led it her that morning, did you? It never fell out of her handbag because she never had it. It was lying beside her body that night because you dropped it there, didn't you? Okay. If you say so, I dropped it. When? I don't know. Sometime after Alan ran away, I suppose. We were both laughing so much, I don't remember. You and Anne? Yes. Why were you laughing? Alan and the gun. He was so funny. What were you doing there? I'd come to watch. I got her to do it. I got her to do everything. Everything? The men. Blackmail. She learned fast. She really enjoyed it. Something to do for kicks. It's dreary in Craig Allen. How was Anne Laird shot? It's her own fault. I told her not to put any bullets in it. But how was she shot? It was an accident. We were fooling around. I, I suppose my glove got caught in the trigger. It just went off. Valerie, is that the truth or just another of your lies? Anyone can have an accident. Or did you deliberately shoot her? Out of jealousy? Prove it. Go back to your seat. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is not customary for a judge to address the jury at this stage, but this unhappy young man is in your charge, and you are under oath to return a verdict. I will not prolong the matter, because I have no doubt what that verdict must be. Insofar as the last witness, Valerie Gowan, is concerned, the attention for the procurator fiscal will be drawn to her evidence and admitted perjury. You will now retire and consider your verdict. My lord, we are already agreed. Not guilty. And that is the verdict of you all? It is, my lord. So be it. Alan Harper. You have been found not guilty of the crime of murder. The question of rape clearly does not arise, and I direct that you be released forthwith. I will only add that you owe this fortunate outcome not to yourself, but 
to the intransigent stubbornness of your defending counsel, Miss Stanford. She is to be commended. <laughs>